Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. This is our tech show. So ask us some tech questions. Uh, get involved in those comments. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and we'll get banging on. So first question this week is from David Greensmith. And this is a two-parter. First one says, after watching Neil's video on volume spaces, is it one of the advantages of adding spaces being able to reduce pressure slightly to soften and reduce chatter perhaps? I wondered if you've tested that. Um, yeah, to a degree you can reduce pressure slightly because you have got the support later in the travel, which means you're not going to use all of that travel. At the same time though, I like a really firm fork, so I actually keep the same pressure and just rely on the ramp up at the end of the travel. But you know, the coolest thing about air volume spaces is just how easy it is to play with them. I actually made a video ages ago and I did it trail side. I had a spanner, I had um, a shock pump, basically, and a whole bunch of volume spaces. And I did it, I was out in Spain with uh, Jack, the cameraman, and we did it aside a trail riding a rock garden, did it repeatedly until I found what works for me. There's a few clips on screen you're probably watching now. It's really cool. Go and play, go and experiment and find out what works. Although a good tip though, would be to do all your testing on one section of trail and make sure you remove all of the other variables. So keep everything else the same on your bike, keep the same tire pressure, just ride that same section for reference. Then you can really understand what the fork is doing. Uh, use your little O-ring on the fork stanchion tube there as it'll monitor and you'll see how much travel you're using and correlate that, maybe video it as well and you can watch the fork moving or if you've got a GoPro or any sort of action cam, try and get it on the bike so you can actually see what's going on. And there can be a noticeable difference just by changing around with air pressures and volume spaces. Good fun that. Um, second question, have you got any tips to reduce neck pain base of the neck after ride. I've had that recently actually. Um, I've changed to one up carbon bars recently and have changed the geometry slightly. Rise and reach seems about the same. I expected them to tone down vibration, reduce pump. Um, well, yeah, I'm sure the bars will do that, but obviously t even tiny little variants in your cockpit position can make a massive difference in how your bike feels. And let's be uh, like, it's really clear about this. So if you're doing a sort of riding that involves a lot of saddle time, a lot of climbing, a lot of stuff on the flat, then body position on the bike is really important. If you're a sort of a downhill rider, it's more about the handling position. There's two sort of different aspects to this. And what I mean by body position is something that road riders, our friends over at GCN, they know a lot about because they do body fit on their bikes. And the reason for that is you can actually damage yourself. You can injure yourself, whether it's a temporary injury and a bit of nerve pain or something a bit more serious like knee pain, ankle pain, hip pain even lower back pain from having things set up the wrong way. So just think all the different variables that are on your bike, the crank length, the width of your pedals apart, the cleat position of your pedals, the angle of your saddle, how far forward and back your saddle is, all of that changes the weight that goes onto your wrists. Yeah, and the same, if your bar's moved in any sort of way, you might be pitching yourself too further back or too further forwards compared to what you're used to. And accordingly, you're just gonna be moving around a tiny bit at a time. And I have it, if I haven't ridden cross country for a while, if I go out for a longer ride, like a 20 mile plus sort of ride, if I do that on a cross country bike, you find a lot of time you stay in the same position on the bikes. And until I've dialed into it, I know my position is okay on the bike, but until I've dialed into it, I can get a little bit of feeling in the back of my neck and sometimes in my shoulders as well, because you find you're just hunched in the same position, you're not moving around. Whereas more enduro type riding or aggressive trail riding, it's quite dynamic. You're moving around a lot on the bike. You're not in any one position. So do take care with that and go back to your old position just to check and um, make a few measurements. Measure maybe from the end of your bars to your saddle position down to your cranks and down to the, to the floor and then do the same with the new, new bars. And you kind of want to mimic it as much as possible if it was right to start with but you've done it for comfort reasons. Um, you might even need to adjust the stem up or down a bit with the space on top or underneath. Uh, definitely worth playing around with though. Okay, next question's from Sony Hawk. Hey Doddy, I just got some tools, or toys as you might call it, for servicing my suspension if we ever go into full lockdown in Australia. Question, I heard that Fox forks and shocks come from a factory filled with nitrogen. Is that true? If yes, does it make a difference? Um, with the shock, yes it is. In the piggyback bit, uh, you quite often find that the piggyback reservoir is charged with nitrogen. Now you can use air in there in place of it. Um, the behavior of it will be the same. However, the long-term behavior of it can change. Nitrogen is less susceptible to temperatures and it can't really sort of absorb any moisture. So it remains very consistent, which of course is what you want. Um, at the same time, I know plenty of people that fettle with suspension, plenty of tuners that do it for racers, and a quicker way of doing it is to get the adapter and inflate 
that basically inflate the boost behind the IFP with a with a shock pump. It's fine and it was going to be perfectly consistent. We're talking long term here. You know, the manufacturer, when they supply the shock unit, they're going to want it to perform as they intend it to perform for as long as possible in between service intervals. If you're going to be the sort of person that's going to chop and change between setups, it won't be an issue. So just get that little adapter and then you should be good to go. Uh, but really cool. Send us in some pictures of what you do for our top mod section. Love to see it. Um, wicked. And good luck out there. Stay safe, by the way. Okay, next one is from Pit KV Creamies. Bit of a weird random name. Um, do I need to clean stroke sand the brake rotors when swapping from sintered to organic pads? Technically, no. You could just put them straight in, just reset your pistons. Um, but really, you want to give your new brake pads the best chance of bedding in properly. So one of the most crucial things of any disc brake is the fact you bed in your brake pads. And that means depositing some of the material from the pad onto the disc rotor. You do that in the bedding in process. Now, if your rotors have already got old, old material on or they're torched or they're glazed or anything, it's not gonna do it properly. So do yourself a favor, yeah, and just clean them. Again, you don't have to, but this is gonna improve your situation with the new pads. Um, I don't think it matters if you're going between sintered and resin. I think it's just if you're changing pads, it's a good idea to do that. And so best use some isopropyl alcohol or disc brake cleaner if you've got that. Clean the disc rotors down, then clean them with some hot water afterwards to make sure there's no residue. Use a pair of rubber gloves or nitrile gloves to make sure you get no oil residue from your hands on the rotors. And then get some fine glass paper, sandpaper, emery paper, something like that and just rough them up very slightly. You don't go crazy, just enough to add a tiny bit to the surface that when you start the bedding in process with those new pads, a little bit can take a little faster. It just makes things a bit easier and quicker. Uh, so the answer is no, but yes. <laughs> bit vague, sorry. Yeah, next one's from Rory MTB. Can you get rid of the creak between the top of the stanchion and the crown? Uh, I've got a 180 Fox 36 and it's getting annoying. Dude, no, uh, go and get them checked because they're push fit, they should not be moving. Movement equals creaking in a fork crown. Uh, you do not want any chance of anything. Could be the stanchions, could also be the steerer tube. Um, although it's very rare, it's gonna happen from time to time. You think how many thousands and thousands of those go through the factory, you know, stamped in a machine. One of them might have been just not quite aligned as it went in the machine or any number of minute things that happen. Get them checked for your own safety because if they are loose, they're going to creak and that is not a good thing. And uh, you might be cruising for a trip to a dentist. So I would be keen to get a new CSU, which is a crown steerer upper tube in place on there if possible. Um, just be safe, dude. That's like not a good thing, despite the noise as well. Oh. Um, next up from JSky5. How can I buy a mountain bike online if I don't have any experience riding and I can't go to a shop to test or demo? What do I need to look out for in the geometry and the components? Okay, forget the geometry and forget the components for now. You just need to ask yourself a few basic questions and then that's gonna start the process of breaking down what you need to find out. We've got a whole bunch of videos on the GMBM which will help you identify the type of rider you are and there's gonna be a link to a few of those in the description underneath. But so what is your, for, uh, your previous bike and uh, what was good about it and what's bad about it? I suggest you write these things down on a bit of paper. It becomes quite black and white, you're gonna narrow things down quicker. Um, how often do you ride? So is it gonna be worth you spending say five grand or do you just need to spend 500? You know, it all goes into consideration. Do you really need to spend all that money? What is your ability? Someone who's a really good ability of rider might want something a little bit more substantial, something that's going to resist the amount that they're going to ride the bike and to the level that they're going to ride at, than someone who might not ride quite so often or not so hard. So again, you could save money there if your ability is on the more entry level rather than the more pro, sort of pro level. Um, what sort of terrain do you like to ride and what is your budget? Yeah, so the terrain, again, if you're going to ride more um, flow trails and more relaxed country lanes and bridleways, things like that, then you could go for a hardtail quite easily. You don't necessarily need to go for a six inch travel, gnarly enduro bike. That said, if you are intending on riding uh, really crazy, like Welsh off-road descents with rocks and roots and stuff, you're gonna wanna look at something a bit more substantial to cater for that. And the same accordingly goes to the budget. You've gotta take all of those things into account. If you start writing down all this on a bit of paper, you start formulating who you are as a rider, how often you're gonna ride, and what you're gonna be able to justify spending. And I mean that in both the budget sense and what actually makes sense to spend on a bike. Then, of course, there's gonna be a big search online. I think we could probably help you out here. We could probably make a video on how to buy a bike online. Um, it's a difficult difficult subject because if you can't get to bikes to try them, you're totally going in blind. At the same time though, it's really hard to buy a bad bike these days. Honestly, if you're buying a modern bike, most mountain bike brands have got it sorted. Of course, there's gonna be a few bikes that are better than other ones, but 
you're not really going to get anything duff bikes are pretty good today but ideally what you want to do is combine some sort of weekender or holiday trip with a bike demo there's a lot of them around the world a great example of a place you might want to go for holiday if you lived in America would be Outer Bike, which is at Moab. It happens, I think, around October time of year, um, or I might be completely wrong, it might be about this time of year, but not happening now because of what's going on. But look up things like that. You can go to those, you can go to Sea Otter. There's loads of massive events in the calendar that will be happening in due course. And you can go to those and you can demo the bikes. You can go and try them out in the flesh. And then you rapidly find out what you want. We can also do a video, I think, to try and help you on how to demo a bike because there is a bit of a formula to it because it can be too easy to get on a bike. You go into a honeymoon phase, oh my God, I love this one more than the last one. But you don't really know how to identify what it was that you loved compared to the last one. Um, so I'll come back to you and I will make a video on that. But you can start making a process easy and less daunting for yourself by breaking down all the things that you don't need about a bike. And then you just can start narrowing things down. You'll be like, oh, I'm gonna spend a thousand pounds. I want a hardtail, so it's gonna suit where I'm gonna ride. Um, and then suddenly you can start looking for thousand pound hardtails, if you get what I mean. Um, hopefully that's gonna help. And I think that will be a helpful video if we can make both of those two videos, how to buy a bike online and also how to demo a bike. Um, if anyone's got any suggestions for other videos like that, anything helpful we can make to make you uh, make your life easier, let me know, please, in those comments underneath. Okay, next up is from B76 McCluskey. Newbie question, I can't find an answer anywhere. If you take your rear mech off, is there a specific way to mount it back on, as in the angle it sits, if the B-tension screw is lined up correctly? Does it mean a derailleur on correctly, blah, blah, blah? I love the show. Also, is Calvin Jones from Park Tours the GOAT? Yeah, he 100% is the GOAT, uh, and he's got one of the coolest moustaches in the world, which is why I've got a little bit of a feeble effort going on. I'm gonna try and catch him up on that. I'm just gonna delve in here, I'm just gonna grab something out to show you. Nice, big hanger. Right, so you might recognize that as a a hanger off the back of a bike. In fact, it will be that way around, the way you're looking at it. Now this tab here, that is what the B-tension screw, which is that one there, has to sit into on the bike to do its job. It has to go like that. So basically, as you turn it onto the bike, you have to make sure that it's pitched up at a slight angle and you can actually get it in. I'm gonna do a close in detail here so you can see it properly. Um, it's not rocket science, it's relatively easy to do. You just gotta take your time, make sure it's tipped up, screwed in, and make sure that the B-tension screw itself, you can see it sitting above that tab. If it goes around the corner below it, the mech's gonna move around and the B-tension or the B-screw is not gonna do its job. Um, hopefully that uh, close in shot would have made that a little bit easier to see. Uh, next question's from Jack8. Is it possible to replace a PF30 bottom bracket without specialist tools, or even possible to make a poor man's version of the tools? Uh, yeah, okay, so there's obviously different types of press fit bottom brackets. The more expensive ones uh, are like got an alloy sleeve and they're like a bit of a self-extracting design, so that can't, kind of answers that question. You don't need to, they're self-extracting. But with the nylon ones, you kind of gotta be careful with this. In fact, let me have a look. I might have one over here. Hold on a second. So I do have one here. Uh, this is a press fit Shimano bottom bracket. Now the whole point with the press fit bottom bracket versus the original press fit, uh, these ones are much cheaper and they make it easy to manufacture frame. Traditional uh, press fit bottom brackets like BB30 would be the bearing sitting directly into the frame. That is ultimate, but it's obviously very expensive, very time consuming for the manufacturers to make a frame like that. So another option is to make these nylon cups and then the bearings sit into the cup. So you've only got to get the cup to sit into a frame and the tolerances don't have to be quite so high. So it makes it faster to make the frame, easier to make the frame, and these are very easy to make as well. Now these work perfectly well, but they've got a bad reputation for creaking. And ultimately, the reason they creak is because if these are not in completely flush into your frame, like as in like, you know, 90 degrees into the frame, they can walk, which is when they're moving very, very slightly around on the inside of your bottom bracket. And that translates to creaking. Of course, your bike is a giant amplifier, really. All the frame tubes on it can amplify that sound, and it'll drive you mad. Now, it is possible to put these in. You could just do it with a block of wood and tap it in, uh, but chances are, it will at some point start creaking, so it's not in right. A headset press, if you can borrow one of those from a friend, that is great, because you're gonna get it in completely square and straight. 
You could arguably make your own one with some threaded bar, a couple of washers and get yourself uh, yeah, a couple of nuts, a couple of washers, or wing nuts maybe, so you can tighten them up. And a couple of bits of wood, drill out the holes so you've got nice flat bits of wood that are gonna push in and you'll be able to get it nice and tight to push them into the frame. But as for getting them out, it's very easy to damage them without the correct tools because the only way to get them out is to tap them out. And if you don't damage the cup, you will damage the bearing. So only tap them out if you're insistent that you're not gonna be able to use it again if it's completely knackered. Um, but as for going in, yeah, you can do it, but you have to be incredibly careful. Now something else, as well as them going in completely straight into the frame, you wanna make sure you use a press fit retaining compound. This is a very special glue basically. Come somewhere between the glue and the thread lock, the velvets for press fit bottom brackets. Get yourself some of that and also make sure that you prime the shell first. You can get a specific adhesive primer to make sure that when this thing goes in, it cannot move. Oh, at least until you come to smack it out when it's worn out anyway. Um, good luck with that, you can do it. And in fact, I kind of fancy trying to make my own little press. I might do one of those. I've got some random tools, bits of wood. I bet I've got some threaded bar lying around. I'll come back to you on that one. Uh, next up is from, oh, last question. This one's from Josh Lancet 10. I feel like a 10, uh, I feel like a 160 mil fork feels like it's got more grip and I can go faster than a 170. Why is this? It feels that my bike's a bit more nimble as the 170 pushes the front end up while making it harder to ride. Um, it sounds like your bike is optimized around a 160, so by putting a 170 on it, yeah, your weight is going further back to the, uh, basically further back on the bike, and your bottom bracket is getting higher. So that means you're having less weight on that front wheel, so it's gonna feel a bit wishy-washy, a bit vague, your steering's not gonna feel that punchy. By having a 160 on there that your bike is designed for, you're gonna be in attack position, your weight's gonna be on the front, it's gonna feel more agile. Um, so, so yeah, exactly what you're saying. It is gonna have more grip technically. You can return some of this though by altering your cockpit position on the bike. So by going to the 170, you've obviously slackened things off slightly and moved things back. You need to move it forwards and down again to compensate and then get around that. I did that recently on my nuke-proof reactor. I went from the 140 fork, I changed the air shaft in it and turned it to a 150 fork, and I put my stem down a 10 mil spacer and rolled my bars a tiny bit forwards, talking about two degrees, uh, just to kind of compensate to return my position. And it feels almost identical, except I've got the benefit of a slightly taller fork. And my BB is fractionally higher, but I've got my bike in the low bottom bracket setting, uh, which kind of compensates for it. So if you can just return your handlebars down 10 mil, you'll probably get that feeling back that you liked from the 160. Uh, if not, go back to the 160 because it sounds like you got on with it. Now, if anyone's got any great ideas for videos, we are literally all ears. In fact, I am quite literally all ears. Fire them this way at us. What can we make to help you? Earlier in the video, I referenced we're gonna make a sort of, a, not a buying guide, but how to buy a bike online, all the things you need to do. We're gonna do how to buy a second-hand bike as well, and also how to demo a bike. So I think that's three really useful videos. They're packed full of information I think everyone needs to learn about. And this is the ideal time to do that homework as well. If you can't get out there and ride at the moment, you may as well start geeking out on what you wanna get for the future. Uh, like, like I said, if you've got any other great ideas, um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, um, thanks for hanging around. Love you guys. See you later.